what is the commercial plan? So you're doing these trials and you have some more trials planned, which is yes, great. We do. Um, yeah. What is your what is your plan to turn this yeah. into a therapy that can be uh, delivered? Yes. So we actually have multiple plans uh, mm. that will be implemented in a kind of a layered fashion over time. So every company has kind of a pipeline of, of mm. products along the way. We have we have pipelines as well in mind. Some of them are just laboratory ideas right now that will be developed in the products. Some of them involve known technology that has been abandoned by others that we can pick up and use to our advantage. Uh, things that have already gotten uh, into human clinical trials successfully, but never panned out for other purposes that can be used for our purposes or so orphaned drugs kind of thing. Um, but just with a straight uh, a protocol that we're doing now and minor you know, uh, uh, improvements on that protocol, uh, we already are going to be experimentally launching clinical activities in the UK before the end of the year. Wow. Yes, there's there's a group of very bright uh, doctors uh, who are so enthusiastic uh, enthusiastic about uh, what we've done that they they just want to try it, and so we're going to try this on a trial basis. Um, so we have developed software. So, as you mentioned uh, earlier, um, there are three main components of the of the treatment. There's also some nutrients that are included that we've talked about in the past. Um, and uh, generally speaking, it turns out to be much, much, much more complicated than you would imagine. Uh, figuring out how to uh, uh, adjust the dose of each of these three major components as you go along, because mm. I've actually put together, we've put together an expert system that takes into account over a hundred different factors that go into just choosing the direction of each one of the changes in these three things. You wouldn't think it could be that complicated, but actually it really is because so many things are going on. We have to pay attention to a lot of different things that are going on. Uh, we measure all kinds of um, uh, blood uh, levels of, of different uh, items in the blood. And, uh, and and we try to look at the person holistically and what's going on with them and, and try to figure out what's you know what the best course for them. And there are contradictions. There's, there, there are indices that say increase this, and there are uh, some things that say decrease that. And you have to decide what's more important and what's the hierarchy and all of this. And to ask a naive physician, even a good, smart physician, to figure all of this out on the fly, it's unreasonable. They're not going to do it. It's not going to happen correctly. I spend tremendous amounts of time on this myself, and I've been doing this for years. So we've been developing the expert systems to to make this possible. And we're gonna be testing this more and more. So far, the expert system has made uh, appropriate calls every time uh, that we that we tested it recently. And that's, that's gonna be necessary for deploying this. It's also gonna be helpful for us to retain control over the, over the treatment because doctors really need to work with us in order to do this correctly. And we're not going to license the use of this technique to clinics that aren't doing it correctly. So if if the clinics are following uh, our protocol uh, with our software and reporting their data back to us so we can continuously refine that software, then we know that they're going to be maximizing efficacy and minimizing any harmful side effects. Uh, and at the same time, our expert system, which will be converted into an AI over a fairly short amount of time, will get stronger and stronger and we'll be able to do a better and better job of, of, of expanding this. So this is the way that we can develop the treatment into something that can be uniformly applied by many different doctors, many different clinics around the world uh, in a way that is consistent, uh, in a way that is correct, in a way that continues to feed back on us to make it even better. So, you know, there are many different people of, one of the things that, that makes it so complicated is that everybody's an individual. People respond differently to the same stimulus. And sometimes it's not apparent what's going on for a while. And sometimes the body changes, you know, the body actually adapts to some of the treatments and you have to adjust for that as you go along. So it gets very, very complicated. So you need to have a uniform 
way of dealing with all of this so that you get a uniform result. And you need that sort of thing to minimize uh, variations and outcome that blur the statistics that make it harder to get FDA approval. So this clinic that we're working with now is operating in a jurisdiction in which they don't need regulatory approval. In the United States, you need the FDA to approve this. The FDA has looked at our treatment and decided that even though we're, we're every, all three components of our treatment are vanilla as far as the FDA is concerned, and the FDA is not actually worried about our treatment. They're not, they're not, it doesn't bother them, but they consider it a new drug entity. And I have to say, I'm, I agree with them about that because the combination does things that none of the th three components do by themselves. So it really is an interaction between these three things that we're, that we're taking into the clinical market in the United States. So I have to agree with the FDA that it, that it, that it needs to be seen as such. Uh, and so we're, we're going to be going down a regulatory pathway that the FDA will approve. Uh, uh, and meanwhile, we'll have some jurisdiction in which we can operate uh, more freely and expand our range of experience. And we can bring all of this together so that whatever we submit to the FDA in the end will be informed by the largest number of experiences possible. Uh, but meanwhile, it won't be held up indefinitely, you know, by, you know, the regulatory process because it can be sort of introduced gradually and slowly in, in different ways as we feel our way along. So I think this is a, a an appropriate way to go. It kind of strikes a balance between the fact that people have an immediate need for aging interventions and the fact that you don't want to go uh, headlong into something that might have uh, complications that you haven't discovered yet. So, you know, I think this sort of gradual, thoughtful scientific approach is, is, is appropriate and will get us into the clinic. And if we can make this a scalable process in spite of all the complexities, and we think mm -hmm. we can do that, then it can be expanded to millions and millions of people. And if we're doing this um, in a way that brings revenues back to us as a company, we will benefit. Uh, you know, and, and even as the patients, you know, benefit all over the world. So that's that's kind of the plan. That's the straightforward mm -hmm. plan. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, other ways that we will, you know, uh, open up markets will be to improve the the therapy in various ways by developing our own biologic agents. We've recently discovered an agent that seems to, well. I'll just say in my own case, you know, because we have limited experience, we're, we're testing this in other people now. Uh, we tested in Bobby and myself. And we, we found that this other completely novel agent was able to reverse our aging uh, based on these uh, epigenetic aging clocks. Actually, uh, in this case, it's just a plasma phenolase clock. I have to correct myself there. Uh, but but um, I showed a slide in Berlin earlier this month showing that in my case, when I en entered the CRIM-XA trial, my plasma phenol age went back about four years and it took about a year to do that. But on this, with this novel agent all by itself, I went back six years and about 90 days. Uh, and then I've done limited uh, trials on myself, combining the two treatments and, they, and that we get similar results, if not even more robust results when we combine the two. So we may be able to, um, augment uh, the uh, benefits of, uh, of the TRIM uh, protocol by combining it with this other uh, novel agent. So we have, uh, we have a lot of things like that, that that we're working on that we haven't been able to talk about yet, but we have a lot of opportunities to, to uh, commercialize our goals, which are basically to deal with the thymus first and foremost, but aging in general, uh, you know, as we're able to expand out into more detailed studies of aging more globally. Right. So I know that the like pricing, especially in, in medicine is, is generally not related to, uh, I guess to cost, but uh, I mean, it did concern me like just the complexity of the solution and the way that certainly in the trials you're, you're constantly reviewing would yeah. mean that the cost would have to be reasonably high because of the amount of Intervention. 
me up because of the amount of brain power that's required to you know figure out how to administer this treatment if he could just take a pill like a lot of other treatments you, you know it'd be a lot simpler but we're not quite there yet we may get closer to that over time you know i anticipate that what we will discover over time is that uh uh I don't want to say patient because, you know, we're treating people who are not sick, but, you know, uh, let's say volunteer categories or in the future, maybe even patient categories will be discovered in which we can say, okay, based on this, that, and the other thing, we can put you in category A, B, C, D, or E. And that means that you will follow this kind of course or this kind of course or that kind of course. And then if we can do that, we may be able to make this a lot simpler. Uh, we're not there yet, but eventually right. we may be able to get there. Uh, in any case, yes. So the cost uh is partly labor you know it's partly mm -hmm. brain power but that's one reason to introduce these computer uh docs essentially these computer uh assistants uh because then uh i mean one of the problems with medicine today is at least in the united states you go in to see your doctor and he spends 10 minutes with you and then gives you a pill and sends you on your way right that you can't possibly understand much you know about a patient's general health with that uh, short of, a, of an exposure to that patient, then you see the patient two years later and you've forgotten everything you knew about the patient before. Uh, so uh, we need to make these things efficient, right? Because that's all the time the doctors have for you. And so if the doctor can just plug your numbers into uh, uh, into us, essentially he's, he downloads the, the patient results to us, goes into our computers, it gets processed by our AI, comes back to him with the dose updates for that person for the next three months or whatever, the next six months, that's doable. He can do that and he'll get paid, you know, because he's offering the service, the patient will pay him, we'll get a referral, you know, we'll, we'll get our, our cut of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the patient will benefit and the doctor will benefit, will benefit, everything will, will work out. I think that's the only way to do this at this point. But, you know, I think we can do it. <laughs>